When I was in high school, I thought I was practicing. It wasn't until I went to Berkeley to study under Joe Viola. He not only turned me on to material, but he turned me on to the whole concept of how to practice correctly. There are three prominent books that I used to, I, I would practice all the time. His concept was, it wasn't about what we practice, it's about how you practice. I wasn't working or sleeping or eating, I was practicing. That's one of the all-time great saxophone players and educators, Eric Marienthal. He has won Grammys. He has recorded on countless albums and soundtracks, including six of his own as a leader. He has performed with many of the world's greatest musicians in a multitude of genres and is also the author of several outstanding saxophone study books. Eric is really the saxophone player saxophonist. I put a link in the show notes to his website, ericmarienthal.com. Be sure to check out his online course as well as tour dates while you're there. In this interview, Eric shares with me the surprising stuff he practiced for eight hours a day while he was at Berkeley. He tells us some great stories from his time touring with Chick Corea, and he lets us know what it's like to record as a studio musician for major motion picture soundtracks. This is one of my favorite episodes of the podcast so far. Please enjoy my conversation with the great Eric Marienthal. Eric Marienthal, wonderful to have you on the podcast. Thank you very much, Jay. Pleasure to be here. Thank you for having me. I saw you not too long ago in uh, Anaheim at the NAMM show. Right. And then since then, I know you've been traveling all over and performing. You were you were in the in Europe, weren't you? I was. Yeah, I, I was on a month long tour, uh, like three days shy of a month um, with uh, a band that Dave Weckl put together, my old uh, Chick Corea electric band uh, mate. Um, with Tom Kennedy on bass and Stu Miniman uh, from Chicago on uh, piano. And it was really fun. I think we did uh, 22 concerts in about 27 days. So we were moving around quite a bit. Wow. Yeah. That's, that's serious. That's serious. And now you're, you're back and I hope, and I looked at your website, you've got lots of local concerts too. Uh, yeah, yeah, I live um, not too far from LA. I'm down in Newport Beach, uh, so about an hour south of LA. And um, yeah, there's a club in Seal Beach called Spaghettini, uh, and it's fantastic. Carrie Hardwick, um, uh, you know, has done just an amazing job with it. And so um, uh, each month I have a, a show and I have a different guest artist come and um, and play so uh you know my band has the you know well the enviable task of of uh, learning uh new music each month and it's also the unenviable task in that it's a fair amount of work <laughs> but it's always incredibly fun we, you know great band and always fun you know it's just fun to have that kind of a um you know a, a monthly uh thing where we get to play and then we get to you know play some other stuff too Everyone can get all your tour dates on your website, right? It's ericmarienthal.com. Is that, that it? That's it. Yeah. I just have to be able to spell Marienthal. That's the hardest part. <laughs> <laughs> it's spelled just the way it sounds, it's, though. Exactly. <laughs> it was so hard about that. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> it just sounded out. It's, <laughs> and it's great. I'm glad this, that you got your saxophone. Not everybody uh, plays on on these podcasts. So I'm I'm thrilled that we have, we have uh, that to look forward to, hearing... Eric play a bit and but don't just listen to him here on on, on this podcast you want to go out and and catch a live show if ever you can and that's a mark six you got there yep an old mark six. well that leads me to one of my my questions that I ask everybody oh. is gear so tell us about your gear uh gear well um this is my uh my baby my alto uh it's a mark six um you know 201,000 that I bought um 
brand new when I was in high school. Um, you know, the when I was in high school, the Mark Sixes were the new horns to get. You know, and um, so as a matter of fact, you know, I, I played. I was playing a majestic when I was a freshman in high school. I, I, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Your expression says it all. <laughs> I've never heard of them since, seen them since. Uh, one person actually did mention that they've heard of it. But, um, you know, my band director said, you know, you're getting pretty serious with this. You should buy a, a new instrument, you know. And, and so he writes down the name of the horn, and I took it to the store and borrowed $420 from my dad. And... Um, I said, yeah, I'd like a Selmer VI. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and he, you know, here you go, kid. And he puts the case on my, on, on the counter. And I gave him my, you know, gave him my 420 bucks and paid my dad back $20 a month until it was paid off. And, and okay. same horn. Yeah. So that has, that's been around that horn. Yeah. That has been with you yeah absolutely i mean i've got other horns too i've got some other really you know nice instruments and and uh i was just talking to somebody about this yesterday where you know i i know people who have their favorite horns at home and never take them out of the house and just play you know don't want to take their best horns on the road which is understandable but at the same time you know we're not going to live forever and so why if you've got your favorite horn why not play it why not play it always and if something happens, something happens. But, um, you know, and then my Mark six, I bought from Bob Shepard many years ago, uh, my tenor rather, which is also a Mark six. And then that the, uh, my soprano is a Yamaha. Like I mentioned, it's a, it's a, uh, um, it's a YSS 62, uh, that came out a number of years ago as well before the, the customs. And, um, and it's just, there's just these magic horns when Ruben Allen here in LA got a shipment of about 20 of them many years ago. And when he got them, he recognized that they were special and he called, uh, he called me, he called a bunch of people. He called Dan Higgins. He called Brian Scanlon. He called Leo Potts, uh, and said, you know, I got these horns. You should really come check them out. And it was like, you know, Harry Potter going to the wand store and buying, you know, trying out wands. Everybody tried the different horns and it was each, there was a, the one, for instance, that Leo Potts bought, great classical player. Um, I tried before Leo got there, and I, I didn't really dig it. But he picked that one, and it was just really special for him. And the one I picked for myself was very special. And most of the pads, this horn is, a, is probably 30 years old. Most of the pads are original, um, and I, I play the heck out of it. I mean, I play it a lot. And it's just, these, you know, and it's very, very in tune, and, and you know, it, they just play really easily. So, so they're you know, that's, that's the horn thing. So yesterday I was at, uh, Selmer and that, and you know, they have all, they have their new saxophones, the Supremes. And then they've, you know, they've had a lot of new saxophones since the Mark six. Yeah. And recently I did a video on the YouTube channel about the new saxophone and, you know, versus the Mark six and that whole thing. Um, and it's just interesting because I was there talking with them yesterday and I would just ask you that, what is it about these vintage horns besides obviously the sentimental value of having, you know, of kind of growing with these saxophones for so long, what is it about vintage horns, certain vintage horns say, you know, like why would, why is maybe your Mark six the one as opposed to a new summer or a new Yamaha or something. Yeah. I mean, you get 10 different saxophone players and you're going to get 10 very, very different answers. I could ask that same question of you and you and I might have the identical answer and we may have completely opposite answers. Um, you know, it is, it, you're right. Part of it is, you know, partly sentimental, partly just what you're used to. You know, when, when we play, you know, we develop um, a relationship with our horns, you know, I mean, in, in as much as you know, we, we practice and practice and practice to get to the point where you're feeling very, very comfortable in the instrument that you're playing. And so uh, when people talk about sound for that, for instance, you know, you can try all kinds of different gear and mouthpieces and reeds and ligatures and neck straps even. And it's, you know, in, in search of a particular sound, but 
I, my opinion, in reality, it's more of a, a, a search of a particular comfort level. You know, what are you most comfortable with? Because I think that everybody plays the way they're going to play. And the way you play, the way you're built, the way you blow into the instrument, the way your embouchure is just naturally uh, formed, ha and just your own personality is going to shape the way you sound far more so than any gear. So I always tell people, you know, I wouldn't necessarily look for a particular sound. I would just look for what you know, f what feels right, you know, Harry Potter and the wand story, you know, just, you know, what you dig. So for me, I, I know that a lot of companies, Selmer in particular, are making really great instruments. Um, and I've tried them and they're great. You know, for me personally, my Mark VI is just what I have the closest uh, connection with from a feel standpoint. So it just feels very natural, you know, and this one in particular, um, even though it's a later one, 201695 is my serial number, you know, and which is pretty late, right? Um, uh, but it doesn't, it, it plays, it's just. Right, because those are supposed to be inferior to the early ones, but, you know, there's no, that's, is that just a complete myth or is that a, you know, how much truth is there to that? Well, yeah, I mean, I could ask you the same question. I mean, you probably have a far better answer than I do, actually, Jay. Um, it's, I think each horn, you know, each horn was made uh, differently. It's like, you know, I'm going to plug my mouthpiece. You know, I've got my Eric Marienthal uh, signature mouthpieces here, right? And so, you know, each one is is machine made. Uh, unlike Selmer, I'm pretty sure they were all handmade back then, or, you know, a combination at least. And even though these are CNC made, you know, machine made, same material, they're metal even, you know, each one feels a little bit different. You know, I can't, nobody can explain why each one is a little teeny bit different. And especially with a little thing like this, it's identical material, identical manufacturing technique. Everything's exactly the same. So they should in theory play, you know, there should be no difference. And maybe, maybe I'm, you know, I've been playing for eons you know I'm, I'm, a, I'm an old man i've been playing since i was a kid and so you know maybe i, I just feel it a little bit more in, you know maybe i'm more plugged in because i you know design the mouthpiece and things but but the point is that you don't just say oh you know that's a 148 serial number mark six it's going to automatically be great or it's a 201 serial number on a mark six it's for sure going to be terrible you know <laughs> Well, I don't think, I don't think they, you know, that there were this many terrible ones out there. And as True. someone said to me, you know, the terrible ones are probably uh, have been recycled by now, you know, and now we're left with just the good ones. That's right. Somebody's lamp by now. Yeah. <laughs> and, and a couple other very interesting things you said that I want to go back to. First one is that you're bringing your favorite horn with you on the road all the time. And that's the case. So you've always taken your favorite saxophone, which I guess is your Mark VI, on the road with you. Yeah, I mean, ab for sure. I mean, I, I actually took a horn. Uh, I don't think it was with Chick, but, but it was a shorter, probably a two-week tour. I took a tour. I took a, a horn that was, you know, very nice and shiny and new. And, you know, I thought, oh, well, you know, not only am I going to be able to, this is going to be great. Because I'm going to perform with this nice shiny horn, it's going to look fantastic, and uh, I'll, I won't have, take a chance of you know losing my Mark VI, you know. And I regretted it the second I started the first sound check. It's like, man, you know, what are you, what are you doing? You know, your your baby's mm -hmm. sitting at home. So not that the other horn wasn't good. It's just, you know, you, you know, I, I, I think it's a good adage to live by. It's like, you know, don't, don't save for tomorrow, but you, what you can you know, take advantage of today because, you know, you never know what tomorrow may bring, you know, live, live, live moment to moment. <laughs> and probably, you know, thousands of concerts later, you still haven't lost your Mark VI. So I guess it's, statistically you're doing pretty well. That's right. The only time I ever came close was I was in South Africa with Jeff Lorber and uh, we played the Cape Town Jazz Festival and uh, Jeff got really sick. He, he got the flu, but really, really bad. And I said, hey, Jeff, you know, let's let's stay for a few days and let you get, you know, better and then we'll go home, you know. He said, no, 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 I want to go home, but if you don't mind kind of just helping me and, you know, helping me with my stuff, I'd really appreciate it. So we did. And so 
you know, he, but he was really sick. I was very worried about him. We go, we get to the airport, go through security. I'm helping him with his carry-ons and things. We get down to the gate and we're sitting there. We got it, you know, about an hour and a half early. And I look around and I don't see my alto. And, and um, I think in a flash, I, I think, oh my God, I left it at security. So and we are a ways away from the security. So I run down to the security office and it's, it's a madhouse. And I'm, 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 you know, in a panic, I'm, I'm, you know, asking the guys, do you see a, 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 an instrument? Do you see an instrument? No, nope. everybody's shaking their heads. And I look over and there's an office that says security on top and the door is open. And there's a man sitting behind his desk looking at me kind of just, you know, with a smile on his face. And there is my horn on his desk. And I run to the desk and it was as if I had left my six month old baby, you know, I grabbed the horn <laughs> and, I, and, and I said, oh man, thank you so much for, you know, get, he, he says, you know, there's a festival going on. We see a lot of musicians going through here and um, I would have paged you, but there's no tag on the case. And I realized, oh man, I've got tags on everything that I'm checking and everything else, but my al there's no tag on my alto because it never leaves my sight, you know, like literally never leaves my side. And so I never thought to put any kind of identification. I have it now, you know, so in in all these years, that's the only time when I've ever, you know, had an issue. <laughs> okay. Wow. Everyone, yeah. I think, well, yeah, I know. I mean, I've almost lost a horn, left a horn behind on a trip as well once. And, we got it back. <laughs> and once... Actually, once I left a, I was traveling with my bandmates, and I left the horn in the trunk of the ca of the taxi. <laughs> and you know your ma. <laughs> yeah, and then they, uh, you know, but they 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 got it, but they didn't tell me. <laughs> oh. You know, oh, man. <laughs> until I realized. Until I realized it's freaked out. Oh, have you seen my saxophone? No, no. Oh, yeah. They let it. They let it go for a while. Uh, <laughs> oh man! <laughs> but we always we always played jokes on each other. So. Oh, nice, nice joke. I, I nice buddies you've got. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The other thing I wanted to go back to was when you said that your soprano. Uh, what year did you get that soprano? Um, I want to say like eighty eight or eighty nine. Okay. Um, yeah, because you said it was about 30 years old. So you said it's mostly original pads on it. So are you swabbing that out after every time you play it? No, no, I actually, um, well, I, 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 yeah, I swab it out. I do. But, um, but a very smart man told me, you know, I used to put a, a the shove it in there, you know, and, and my repair guy said, uh, no, 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 don't do that. Because, you know, you're leaving all the moisture, you're keeping them, you, you know, you, all the moisture is going to stay on the pads and they're going to go bad much more quickly. So I, yeah, I clean out my horns when I'm done, clean out my mouthpiece, clean out my breed. Um, but then I let it, you know, sort of air. Air dry. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, I try, I tell people a lot that if you do that, if you swab out your horn and you let it get dry inside, don't put like the really wet horn back in the case, close it up if you, if you can, because then you're just locking in a lot of moisture in your case gets kind of, yeah, Funky. the only exception for me, I don't know what your process is, but as far as the reed is concerned, if I, uh, I, I have luck if I take my mouthpiece and I, I'm done, I take the reed and I clean off the reed, you know, and then I put the reed back on the mouthpiece, put the cap on, um, wrap up, put it back on the neck, put the um, the neck, wrap up the neck, put it in the bell and close the case, and it acts like a little humidifier. Because, you know, mm. and so the next day, the reed will feel exactly the way it did the night before, you know, and it won't dry out. My, if I take a reed and take it out, uh, off the mouthpiece and put it into a, a case or whatever, the next day it'll feel different. It might be a little drier. You know, again, you know, everybody's got a different uh, approach to that. But no, but absolutely. Absolutely. That's that, I think that's a great way to do it uh, because. Apparently, Chris Potter, he just takes a reed. He gets a reed he likes and he doesn't take it off. The mouthpiece ever until it's done and then he puts a new one on and he keeps the mouthpiece in like a a ziploc bag ah there with you, the, you know with the you know after he plays so it's it probably gets pretty pretty uh <laughs> yeah and chris is a great example of somebody who is the opposite of a of a, a readaholic i mean he'll he's famous for just taking a read putting it on the horn and and playing it you know yeah you know amazing yeah, yeah. so 
that's it's great to hear how everyone does it though i find it really interesting and it's great to, to, to hear that there's so many different ways that work you know and everyone has to kind of do it what works for them i find if you put a read like if you're if you're using a read case and you put a read in a read case but that case is in like a closed up case it can get moldy mm. and so one thing i found is if you're going to use a read case make sure the read because the, usually they have holes in them and so it needs to get some air circulation in there to avoid that mold right yeah yeah and i you know i mean i'm not a lot of people are obviously into um rotating their reads too which you know obviously for a lot of people it works just great you know i, I am i i kind of find that once i've got a read going i like to keep that read going and, and you get kind of into that particular feel so yeah i'm the same way and what so what um what's tell us more about the mouthpiece and the tip opening and the read you're using on it oh this mouthpiece you mean the eric Marietta yeah. special mm -hmm. mouthpiece that one right there is that what you're talking yep. about <laughs> yeah <laughs> um uh yeah this is what i'm using on my alto and my tenor um and uh with with this it comes with a uh it comes with a leather ligature um because we just wanted it's and the ligature is actually good uh we didn't want to sell the mouthpiece without a ligature we want to be able to sell the mouthpiece so that when you get the mouthpiece you can play right away um uh, you got to buy your own reads however but uh, besides that we do have a ligature but for me i'm finding that um uh, my Ishimori ligature is working um, really well on this, and Ishimori is one of the few uh, lig companies that are making a ligature that'll fit on a metal alto mouthpiece. Um, that fit like actually made for that exact size, um, right. and um, and yeah, and then uh, I use Van Dorn two and a half. Uh, blue box uh traditional blue box reads on on everything the clarinet i i play threes but but um everything else i play two and halves uh, and what's the tip opening of that mouthpiece uh it's well we call it a seven so i think it's like an 81 um uh, you know 8100 is that what you call it yeah you uh, thousands of eighty-one thousands. yeah thank you <laughs> um and uh we have a size we have one size smaller and one size no, one size smaller. That's it. It's a little bit smaller, but uh, yeah, um, the mouthpiece was designed uh, with this size. You know, this is the size that the original design was, and then we decided to make one so people would have an option. So right, and is it uh, does it have a high baffle roll? Like, is it a step baffle rollover baffle? Uh, no, I mean, I didn't want to take this one off. It's, uh, um, but it's it's that. Oh, so, okay. Um, yeah. So uh, okay. fairly high baffle, I suppose. Um, that was one of the things. This is about the forty-fifth iteration uh, of the mouthpiece that we um, that we came up with. Um, you know, it took about a year and a half to get to the point where I, I liked it more than what I was playing before. Um, and so it's very shiny. See how shiny that is? Glitter. <laughs> <laughs> you can shave with this mouthpiece. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> that's, uh, and that's made by uh, Retro Revival. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it was interesting because we tried high baffles, low baffles, and different things in the different shapes of the chamber. And just it ended up being pretty, pretty darn open inside um, with a kind of a, I don't know if you call it a high or low baffle, really. It's just kind of the way it is, you know? Um, yeah. I mean, from what I can see here, it doesn't look like a really high baffle. It looks, looks kind of, yeah. you know, it doesn't look particularly high and it doesn't, and it's kind of like a straight slope there. I imagine the chamber is on the smaller side. Yeah. I, I no. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah. And, you know, it's, it's cool. Here, I'll play a little bit so you can. Great. Uh, so one of the things that i you know like yourself you know you really want to feel like it's not going to close up uh in general that's the main thing you know so many uh 
mouthpieces, horns, necks for that matter. Um, you know, the criteria for me is that it's something that is not going to, um, where you don't feel like you're coming up to a wall, you know, it doesn't back up. So, but at the same time, it's just like choosing a hard beat over a soft beat and what, how to find, you know, you want to have with your, with your mouthpiece choice, you want to have something that's going to give you enough resistance without being difficult to play. Because the, the thing that's going to turn you off immediately when you play is, is for it to feel difficult. So if you can play something that's just easy to play. <laughs> At the same time, doesn't back up when you go a little higher and still sounds uh, full. And then you can play, you know, altissimo. And then also play down low. So, you know, just being able to articulate, you know, just being able to, um, whether you're playing a jazzy line. Or something, you know, punkier. You know, you want your criteria is that everything feels very available. It's like a, you're in, a, you're in the kitchen and you're cooking and you've got all the ingredients right there and you can grab some of that and you grab some of that. And it's all just there. You're not having to work terribly hard. You know, it's, you know, you've got to find the right kind of read like any other, you know, setup. But but it's still, you know, um, you know, that's the, that's the goal just to find, um, you know, a setup generally that's just where you know everything feels like you you can do it you think of something and and it's and it can be right so and and you want it to be versatile you want it to be able to oh now we're playing a ballad okay oh now we gotta play soft oh now we gotta play really loud because the band is you know or whatever the situation is and you don't want to like oh i need to switch get a different mouthpiece for that but you know you want a mouthpiece that can do every situation you find yourself in on a regular basis yeah yeah exactly you know i live I, I do a lot of studio work here in LA, uh, here in LA. I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm about an hour south. So I'm, I'm close enough to LA to work and far enough to not be in LA. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, you never, you never know. I mean, a majority of the calls that I do like for TV and, and film are more, I get called to play tenor more often and, and uh, just, I'm not sure, but you know, I don't, I don't mind. I'll, I'll play uh, kazoo if they want to have me on the film. <laughs> um, but it, it, it's so, um, it's a little bit frightening just in the read choice alone um, because you, you might be asked to do something that's more of on a, you know, big band or poppy um, thing, which you're going to be playing out a little bit more. But then it very well may be something uh, even on the same date, that's super quiet and super quiet and super low on tenor. I don't know about you, Jay, but that's a frightening, frightening concept when you're doing it in a, on a film and, and everybody's watching and, and, you know, it's a, it's a big thing. I played on, um, on the soundtrack for soul and, uh, John Baptiste, you know, um, was obviously the composer. He won the Academy Award and, um, and, uh, at the end of the, I was actually 
playing a bunch of stuff, but I was playing soprano. At the end of the day, it started with an orchestra and then whittled down to the point where the last cue was um, just four of us. Uh, and it was John playing piano. I was playing soprano. And um, I think Harvey Mason was playing. No, no, no. That was even after Harvey. It was a, me and a French horn. And uh, I think Nathan East was playing upright bass. Anyway, we got to the end of the session. And it was a it was a two and a half minute cue, which for film is a very long cue. And, um, and we had about four minutes to go. And um, if you... If, if 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 you go over that um and we were already in overtime so if you went into another hour of overtime it becomes like golden time and it costs a lot of you know it's good for the musicians but you don't want to be the one to make a mistake you know you might make that extra if you go two seconds into the golden you know the next overtime hour they've got you know by union rules you've got to pay for that extra hour right and so you know you don't mind making the money but you don't want to be the one causing the studio to have to pay that extra money that's for danger you know you're going to enjoy that money and you better spend it slowly because you're not going to make any more <laughs> <laughs> right. you don't want them to be on the list of yeah. guys that cost this more <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah something tells me yeah they're going to call somebody else first and so um and it was a, a real quiet thing and it was about my my cue was about you know my start was maybe a minute into the cue and it was a solo part and and everything was very exposed to only four people so it was just you know it wasn't anything terribly difficult it wasn't the easiest cue of the day but it wasn't terribly difficult you know on any given moment you could play it in your sleep but when the pressure's on like that um it's just like you know okay b you know how many thousands of times have you figured a b you know it's this one you know right <laughs> but, <laughs> the first you, note you learn right? <laughs> and you're counting along okay b's here b's here b's here <laughs> 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 don't clam, don't clam, don't clam. And, and I made it fine. Everybody made it fine. We, we, you know, but that, that whole world is a, is a, we could talk about that forever. You know, I, I after we said goodbye, went back in my car. I had to like sit there for about 15 minutes and just gather myself before I got on the freeway, you know, cause it's just, it's nerve wracking, you know, when you're, you know, it's, it's a nerve wracking. I find thing. that, you know, I, I find, I love hearing that from you. And I know everyone that watches these, loves hearing that. And it, the thing is, it's one thing that every interview I've had with all sorts of great musicians, they all kind of say that same thing. And it is kind of fascinating in a way, because I know a lot of people, you know, that are maybe students of music and, you know, they get really nervous when they have to perform and they often ask me like, how do I deal with that? And, and, and part of the, th I think it's really interesting because they may not be aware that even at the very highest level, you're still as a human dealing with these psychological things. And that, but that's also a big part of it is that you manage to be able to, to, to perform and nail it, even though, you know, in your head, you're like, Oh my, you know what I mean? I find that fascinating. Yeah. I mean, all those years that I played, you know, I was in Chick Corea's the electric band for 35 years, you know, and at every, every one of those tours, you know, we'd come back and um, you just feel like you're, you know, Superman, not being able to play that music um, for, you know, that many concerts in a row. And it was, I, you know, we could talk all day long about that too. I mean, it was just such great music. Any, any music I, I find, I feel um, that's, that is, logical that makes sense it's never difficult it might be difficult technically but it's you, you get it easily quicker because it just it's good you know it makes again it makes sense um and so i remember actually my very first gig i, I played in minneapolis a couple nights ago and uh I played at the dakota jazz club which is right a block away from uh orchestra hall which was a place where i played my very, very first concert with Chick in 1986. And um, reminded me of a very quick story where, um, you know, the very first gig, I was nervous as hell. And, um, you know, made it, you know, did the gig, really fun. And the next morning I went out for a walk and this guy stops me on the street and we were staying really close to the theater, you know? And he says, oh, did you play with, you played with Chick Corea last night, right? And I said, yeah. He goes, man, you were incredible. I mean, you're, I said, oh, thank you so much. I said, oh, no, you're one of the greatest musicians I've ever heard in my life. And I said, oh, man, thank you so very, very much. He goes, by the way, what kind of bass was that you were playing? <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I said, oh, no, that, that was uh, John Petitucci. I was the sax player. He goes, oh, oh, you were good, too. <laughs> Man. <laughs> so John and I look a little bit alike, I guess. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So that's, but that's great. I love, I, I feel free. Any stories you want to tell? <laughs> I, that was going to be one of my questions, but I didn't even have to ask it because I was like, oh, because I know you've just played so much with so many great musicians in so many different places. And you must have forgotten more stories than, you know, most people will ever experience in yeah. multiple lifetimes. Yeah. But I know, I know you've got a bunch of good ones. So if anything triggers a story, feel free to dive right <laughs> into it like that. I love it. One of the things I wanted to ask you, though, is just about like saxophone playing. Like you just demonstrated and you played all this stuff and you're kind of all over and you've got this mastery of technique, sound, intonation, and articulation and different styles. So it's just you have just everything happening, right? Mm-hmm. And I'm curious if you can remember back what was it in your development that kind of allowed you know was there any specific things that you can remember like you know when i figured this out that unlocked this or is there anything like that you you could share uh yeah i mean when i was in high school i i thought i was practicing you know i thought i was um doing what i was supposed to be doing and it wasn't until I, I, I went to Berkeley, Berkeley College of Music, right? And, um, and I was insanely lucky uh, enough to have gotten uh, to study under Joe Viola. And Joe um, was the, you know, he was the preeminent uh, teacher at, at school. And, he, you know, he studied with, from Joe Allard. And it was ironic that um, at Berkeley, which is a, uh, you know, there was a token orchestra. Um, why you would go decide to go to Berkeley if you're a violin player or a viola player, I was never quite sure. So it was really a jazz, really much more of a jazzy school back then. Now it's it, it's a great place for sure, but it's very, there's a lot of different things. But back then it was prominently a, you know, 99%, you know, jazz and pop music. And yet Joe, uh, the main teacher was really a classical saxophone player. Um, he knew a lot about jazz harmony. He wrote those great books. He could do it. Um, but again, he was a classical guy. And so, um, during those lessons, he turned me on to, uh, he, he not only turned me on to material, but he turned me on to the whole concept of how to practice correctly. You know, uh, he, you know, we, he turned me on besides his own books, like the Marcel, um, mule, you know, books, um, that I, I would, I, uh, you know, the etudes like, like this. I mean, I got memorized that. Yeah. these books that that where well i mean there there were all kinds of there were three prominent books that i used to I, I would practice all the time and it got to the point where uh i would well his concept was it wasn't about what we practice it's about how you practice and so as long as you practice you know with a metronome and you practice it, making sure, you know, practice your long tones first to make sure that you're really, you know, keeping your tone steady and all the things that go into that and that you're playing in tune and all the things that are that are necessary uh, to get you to do that. Um, and to play consistently, because when we play, we're trying to develop a relationship with our horn and you just can't do that. There's no magic pill, very unfortunately. Um, you know, we just, as you well know, Jay, you know, you've got to put the time in to develop the, you know, the the muscles and the the general coordination between your articulation and your fingers and and you know a lot of the things that we we do subconsciously um, that have to happen. And so, as long as you're doing those kinds of things, as long as you're you know practicing you know correctly, then what you practice. I mean, we have to practice scales. 
obviously well known, and we have to practice long tones and those kinds of things that, you know, scales are the language of music, that's the backbone of so much music, um, of practically everything. Um, but beyond that, it's what's going to keep you engaged? And the answer to what's going to keep you engaged is, is music that you enjoy playing. You know, it's got to be beneficial, you've got to do it in the right way. But whether it's songs, whether it's scales, whether it's exercises or etudes, um, you know, whatever floats your boat, man, whatever, you know, keeps you going. And so for me, I really fell in love with those books. And I, I had uh, three. And, I, you know, and I used to, when I was at Berkeley, uh, uh, there were these little teeny, you know, practice rooms, right? That uh, uh, it's so many years ago that I won't get in trouble for this. So I can tell it, I can tell the story in public, but, but um, you have to sign up for the practice room and you got two hours. And after the two hours, you get a knock on the door and you have to go back to the front desk and sign up for another two hours and stand in line and do all that stuff. Meanwhile, uh, down a few blocks down the street was the New England Conservatory, where at night, you know, they would open up all their classrooms. And if you, you know, you, you can just practice, whoever, if you find an open practice, a classroom, you could practice there until midnight when they close everything up. So I had a friend who was... Um, going to that school. I'd go see him all the time. And, and the security guard, Joe was, you know, out there at night. And, uh, you know, I went down so often that he just assumed that I was a student there. Hey, Joe. Hey, Eric. You know, and I walk in. So I kind of figured out really quickly that, hey, Joe doesn't know that I'm not a student here, you know. So I, I grab my horn and go in, show up, you know, finish my classes, have some dinner, do my homework, finish up about eight o'clock, go down to New England Conservatory. Hey, Joe, Eric, go into the classroom. And I practice for four hours until they kick me out at midnight every night. Where So my buddies at Berkeley were like sweating it out in these little, you know, refrigerator sized practice rooms. I was like in luxury in a, you know, New England Conservatory. Big room, the piano. And yeah, exactly. <laughs> Air conditioning. And Sound thing. treatment on the walls. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. So nobody ever got hit for that. And then so when I left school, I came back to LA, found a, the cheapest room I could find. I was a, you know, found a job as a busboy in a, you know, you know, so I could survive. And um, when I wasn't uh, working or sleeping or eating, I was practicing, you know, and I, and it was these, there was a college uh, near where I lived and the practice rooms were wide open too. So, um, so I'd go over there and would practice, man, seven, eight, 10, 12 hours a day. And just, but just these books. And I would practice each book cover to cover. That was my routine. I had my warm up, and then I'd open the first book cover to cover, next book cover to cover. And I got, I was so OCD about it that if, I, if for whatever reason I couldn't finish like the, the last exercise of the third book after practicing for nine hours, I like felt like, oh man. I just didn't do it today. You know, I didn't get it all done, you know, even though I had done all this work. And so, um, and that was largely due to the fact that I just loved it, well, loved what I was practicing and loved uh, the result. That's, that's actually one of the real benefits that I try to tell my students too. It's like, man, you know, just give it, practice one day, do all the stuff and do it the way I'm telling you to do it and get to the very end and, Tell me how you felt about it, you know, and next day they'll call and say, oh, man, you know, it was great. It was encouraging because I just felt like I could play so much better when I was at the end of all this work than I did before I started. And so you wake up the next morning, you go, oh, man, you know, I'm better today than I was yesterday. I want to do it again. And then you're a little bit better that day, you know. So conversely, you know, conversely, if you don't do that or you don't do part of that, then you start. We don't we never stay constant. We're either improving or we're declining. <laughs> I think. Okay, well, that's there's a lot going on there. So, f first of all, I need to know the names of those books because everyone's going to be asking, because like, <laughs> that's now the secret. <laughs> this is the secret to to, to becoming great. It's excellent. Are these books? So, <laughs> so we need to, <laughs> if you can remember, just so I could I could put them down there for people. Yeah, yeah. Well, the I know the first book was um, uh, it's in French. I think in the English translation is uh, daily. Daily exercises. I think it's called uh, exercise journals in, in French um, or, or something journals, but daily exercises. And there are 26 A2s in that book. And then the, uh, the other book that I was way into, um, I think it's just called 18 A2s uh, mm. in French. 
And then there was that, uh, the third book wasn't a Marcel Mule book. It was a Pierre Londex book that was very short, but I mean, very, it was only about 10 pages long, but you had to repeat each of the little exercises. And it was just like a, um, in fact, in my book, uh, I, I, I stole the idea. I have these, um, uh, called finger busters where you repeat this book here, that one right there, man. <laughs> wow. How much did I have to look at you it? there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's my, my younger son. <laughs> yeah. My wife always says, why did you wear that shirt? Come on. <laughs> Are you out of your mind? Well, You've got a closet. Well, this closet. shirt, this shirt is nothing wrong with that shirt. It's the one I think she's talking about the one on the back. Both of them actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh. But I think they used for the cover. I would just realize this when I pulled this out for this interview, but I think for the oh, cover, yeah, exactly. they used your shirt as the background or something. It's the, exactly. You, you know? Wow. Cool. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Well, we know it was the 90s. That's all. We now we know it was the 90s. Yeah. That, I, I'll use that excuse, you know. <laughs> I didn't do drugs. I mean, you know, I didn't drink. I don't know what, you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was the 90s. <laughs> oh, brother. Um, yeah. So, and so, you know, there are these little, what do you, you know, little motifs, you know. <laughs> You know, in my book, I expand them some, but the point is that if you think about it, when we play, you know, a lot of it, a lot of just the technique of playing is just simply being able to go from one note to the next note cleanly and also either articulating it or slurring it and articulating it. It's one thing to, you know, it's, it's one thing to, um, you know, play a scale, you know. <laughs> It's another thing to be able to play it exactly in time with a metronome. And it's another thing entirely also to play it in different articulations, you know, whether it's. Or. Or. Right. So, so when you practice something like an exercise, you know, you, if, again, part of ma mastering your instrument is to be able to play anything with any articulation combination that you could conceive. And, and so when you practice like scales or, or repeated exercises or whatever, you know, always change up the articulation. Don't play the same articulation every time you play it, if it's possible. And that way, you know, you're getting much more benefit out of that practice session. You know, one really super duper cool, um, a uh, little idea of practicing that I got from Eddie Daniels, genius clarinet player, is to take, he he explained, one time we were on an airplane, we, we played in the um, GRP All-Star Big Band, and we were on a, a, a tour in Japan, and I, I you know, I, uh, I sat next to Eddie on the way over, and I, you know, it took me about 10 seconds to, you know, and I knew him a little bit back then, you know, so I said, hey, Eddie, you know, what do you practice? <laughs> <laughs> right. One of the, you know, he, I mean, he's an incredible everything player, but, um, but he, yeah, obviously his clarinet playing is legendary. And he says, you know, well, I, I start off in the morning. I, I, uh, I, I pour myself a triple cappuccino and I go down to the basement and I just go and I'll take a, now he'll do these like stratospherically difficult um, versions of this motif practice idea, but just create a little motif, maybe, and maybe even numerically in a scale, say maybe the first degree, one, two, three, five, like, uh, like, you know, as an example, the first, second, third, and fifth uh, note of a G major scale there and play that four times and then play it, uh, play that same pattern up a half step. But each time you do it, or each time you approach it, or each time you think about it, change up the articulation. Maybe the next time, you know. Uh, you know, um, just 
and then come up with a, a like three patterns like that. Even write them down before you even pick up the horn. You know, write down you know maybe seven, two, four, three, or anything. You know, and not just major scales, but maybe you know particularly minor scale or whatever. Three patterns like that with different scales, and you and, and changing up the articulation. Um, you know, you've got yourself a heck of a of an exercise program. You know, and and then um, uh, oh, and then also you know not to practice fast. Don't practice if you want to practice. If you want to be able to play fast, practice for control. Anybody can move their fingers around, right? You know, but practice, um, you know, you want it when you, when you, like, for instance, if you play this. You know, the first five notes of a B minor scale, right? Um, and you want to, you know, play, uh, you know, work on like a jazzy articulation, like tonguing all the upbeats. If you start out playing that too fast, it might be sloppy. I mean, maybe that scale feels comfortable under your fingers. It actually does. But but um, but if you practice it so that you know that anybody can play fast, it's about how how accurate every note is. It's it's the difference between you know not speaking clearly, like I tend to do, and and being able to really enunciate and and you know yeah enunciate every every note. And then eventually you get a feel for, you know, how that feels. And once you have control over something, you can do it at whatever tempo. You know, so it it really is just a matter of playing slow. One quick story. I, I was on the road once, um, one of the tours with Chick, and he was... Um, about to after our tour, he was going to go on tour with an orchestra to play the uh, Mozart piano concerto. So he would practice after the gig. He couldn't take the piano back to his room, so he was practicing um, after the shows. And so I'd hang back. Everybody else would go to the hotel, and I'd be like, you know, how often do you get to hear one of the one of the greatest musicians of all time practice, right? And I expected him to be like, fl you know, flying through this thing. But no, every time he would get to a difficult passage, he'd slow it down and just go, note, 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 and just get a feel for what it felt like to go from one chord or one melody note to the next. And he just played it slow. And it wasn't like he sped up a little bit at a time. Once he got the control of it, it was just like, you know, and he had it, and and that was, was a you know revelation to me. I mean, you know, it was amazing. Wow! All right, so the, uh, this is great. Um, so that that make that that's so super interesting. So you practiced, and you're telling me, if I understood correctly, that when you were doing hours and hours of practice a day, a lot of it was just was working out of these books. And that was it was like a routine. This is something you would go through all those books or some of those books from cover to cover daily. And then I mean, I imagine you also worked on some other things. You didn't just work on that. But that was like a core part of your thing. Yeah, that was that was the uh, meat and potatoes of my practice. I mean, you know, 80 percent of what I did was was that easy for how but many years? I still well, I don't practice eight hours a day now, uh, unfortunately, and a few other things, as you well know, life gets in the way, but, but for a lot of years, I mean, for, you know, well, eight hours a day easily for, I mean, eight plus hours for, you know, 10 years, I mean, you know, for a while, uh, maybe not 10 years, seven or eight years until, um, you know, wife came along, kids came along, um, you know. Yeah house came along <laughs> so this so this book then this is kind of, if this is i understand i have a better understanding now that you told me like the precursor to this this was kind of inspired by the work you were doing in like if 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 eric marienthal was to write a book you know based on what he was practicing or that that's kind of like what this is. This is like, yeah, learn how to play this cover to cover. It might wow. take you eight hours, but <laughs> if you oh, could wow. do that, 
and control it. You could play anything. Yeah. Every note of that book was written on the road with Chick. Every single note, handwritten, by the way, at, at first. Um, and uh, and so I would, if I had a question, uh, harmonically or even, you know, just, I mean, here I was on the road with Chick and John Petitucci and Dave Weckl and Frank Cabali. You know, even Dave, who was, a, you know, a master, I mean, he had... He's got some really interesting, incredible ideas about practice too, rhythmically, uh, melodically too, uh, harmonically too, as a matter of fact. Um, but it was it was great to have. If I had a question about something, I had a pretty rich resource of information right, you know, uh, you know, down the hall of the bus, <laughs> yeah. or backstage, or at the hotel, you know. Um, so uh, yeah, th those guys were very helpful to me uh, um, in terms of of you know uh, you know coming up with some some cool ideas that I was able to run with. Well, I all right, but I I mean, and I get how mastering the instrument technically is you know, and you've obviously done that uh, and through this sort of practice. But then taking that mastery of the instrument and applying it to improvisation. You know, applying it over harmony and different styles. I mean, now that's another sort of study, though, isn't it? Yeah. Well, I could ask you the same question. So, um, but yeah, I, I, I really feel that, and that's why I, I've, I've always been kind of into like the technical side of of the approach to time spent preparing for things. Only that it's like when when we when we want to play music, of course, we want to listen. We have to listen, you know, and listen and listen and listen to all these different things and gain the, you know, gain the ideas and, and you know, the basic feel for what music should be like. But it, it, it's a lot like sitting around, um, you know, the, the dinner table with, with friends or family, right? And so if somebody brings up the subject, it, you know, equated to like different styles of music and how do you play, you know, funky music and classical music and straight ahead, you know, jazz music and, you know, polka music, whatever you're, you know, whatever it is. And you might, the subject at the dinner table might go in this direction and then it's going to go in that direction and then it might go in that direction. And so you're still using the same language. Your, your tongue is still forming the words. You're still, you know, you're speaking, you know, the same things. It's just that, the subject matter is different. And so it might, and because you're talking about one subject over another, um, you know, the way you inflect or, or your emotion behind that is, is maybe different. The, you know, the point is, is that if you have control of your instrument, then it's very easy to, well, it's easier to just change direction. You're still using your technique to play a funky line. You're still using, you know, you got the same read on when you're playing, you know, jazz your line. You're still, you know, A is still fingered like, you know, B is still fingered like that, right? You know, and so um, conversely, if and that's why I really think that generic kinds of practice is really important, you know, because, you know, don't practice with a particular vibrato. I mean, you can practice vibrato separately, but practice just playing without anything that is, you know, going to end up being a habit where you always use that kind of vibrato or you're always <clears throat> uh, scooping at the, you know, the, the, up to a, the pinnacle note of a phrase or whatever. Just don't do anything in your in your nuts and bolts practicing that has anything to do with a, a particular style. And once you can control that, then you can add, then you have the, the you know, you're, you're starting with a blank uh, slate. And it's just your own creativity um, uh, that tells you when to play a particular style, when to play a particular groove, you know, because of who you're playing with. And then then you've got the technique to add those things. It's much easier to add an inflection that you're not already doing than it is to subtract one that you're in the habit of doing. Yeah, I 100% agree with, with that and everything. Yeah. Um, and when I hear you play, man, I mean, you're a great prime example of that. You know, you, you play amazingly all sorts of different styles and, you know, very much how you want to play it. And you're not handcuffed by any particular habits. I'm, I'm a, you know, I'm a big fan of your playing. I hope uh, well, I, I that's, that clear. I, 
Okay. Well, I, 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 that's very nice. I didn't expect to be. <laughs> I didn't. Whenever I, someone says they even listen to me, I'm like, well, really? Ah. But uh, <laughs> people watch this stuff. You know? yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for that. I mean, that's that's fantastic. You're so you know generous with your time and all the information. You're just like, yeah, let's do it. So that's that's really appreciate it. Oh, my pleasure, man. I, it's an honor to be on your on your podcast and playing the playing all the examples. I'm gonna I'm gonna be honest with you. I had this book, you know, for a long time, <laughs> and when I first, uh, you know, I and I, I remember and I haven't opened it probably, you know. 20 years you know, it's just been <laughs> and but now i have an insight into the thought process behind this and it's really you know it's advanced i would say this is this is a pretty advanced book in conceptually because you're going through all these things maybe i should do a little i know what i'm gonna do i'm gonna that's what i'm gonna do <laughs> i did a I did a video on different jazz books you know ones that everybody kind of uses and oh. kind of just did a little overview and maybe i'll I'll add this into the next video like that I do. Oh, uh, man. I'd be honored. That would, that would be interesting. Very cool. Yeah. Well, I appreciate so much the, the, all the insight. And, like, it always blows my mind when, when cats like you are just telling me about all the classical. And this, you're like, you're not the only one. There's so many. Mm. Like, like, oh, yeah, I just practice classical. <laughs> and that always blows my mind a little bit, you know, when I hear that. About playing classical music? Yeah. Oh, well, I mean, I, yeah, I mean, but playing like classical saxophone, you know, um, you know, Pierre Landex and, and uh, um, you know, I mean, Duncan, uh, uh, Dun uh, Preston Duncan is his name, um, you know, playing like real classical saxophone, that's, I, you know, I couldn't even come close to approaching that. But playing, you know, just generically is kind of what, you know, playing just the exercises yeah and the yeah. and the etudes as using them as as practice material though yeah. I, uh, yeah. yeah yeah and then yeah so anyway i'm gonna i'm gonna check i'm gonna spend some time with that now and it's <laughs> no but also it's like you know 100 it's like 200 pages <laughs> of really of just like really challenging stuff i mean this is but now i understand when you explain to me oh yeah i practice like this for this much i'm like okay <laughs> yeah okay that's what somebody who practices like that this is when they write a book this is where it comes out that's a lot I mean, it is like a for most people this would be a few lifetimes worth of practice material <laughs> you know what i mean <laughs> yeah well i might like just take a few pages you know? and that'll be i'll be good for i'll be good for a year you know <laughs> there's a fair amount in there i guess yeah <laughs> Just, this has been great. It's one of my favorite um, conversations about saxophone, uh, and I get to have a lot of really good ones. So thank you so much. And we definitely are going to book another session down the road once everybody gets to digest everything in here because, you know, it's, it's a lot of information already. Very cool, Jerry. Man, I, well, I appreciate it. It's really, you know, I've been following your stuff for a long time, and it's really an honor to be on your show. Well, I, I'm honored that, that, that you watch any of my videos. I mean, that's, I still like it. Right, why do people watch this stuff? But anyway, <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad. <laughs> oh, no, they're, they're great. It's so well put together and so informative and so well played. No, no, you got, you got some amazing stuff. So I, this has been fantastic learning, you know, having you, it's like kind of giving us all a lesson. <laughs> but I know you have some online, like an online course that people can uh, access? I do. Uh, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, uh, it is. It's, it's a school called artistworks.com. Uh, artistworks, like artistworks.com. And um, it's it's all uh, 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 internet-based. And so uh, Artistworks has um, 35 or so uh, schools. Peter Erskine has the drum school. Um, George Whitty has the jazz uh, piano school. And there's lots of different gift cards guitar schools and I have the uh, the uh, saxophone school and what it is is um, that you subscribe uh, to my school and with that subscription um, there are literally hundreds of video lessons um, 
you know, basic lessons, intermediate lessons, um, advanced lessons. Uh, and then there's uh, exercises of the week and there's licks of the week, which are really more like tunes. And there are, you know, hundreds and hundreds of uh, PDFs and uh, that, you know, play along PDFs and tracks to play with. And uh, the way it works is that you can choose any lesson, just, you know, dive in. And it's based on video exchanges, VEs, where, um, where a player will, will work on a particular uh, lesson. And it doesn't necessarily have to be something in my school. It can really be kind of anything. As a matter of fact, a lot of the videos that I get are people who are, you know, working on something of their own, maybe a song of their own or a, a, some other book or whatever. And they film the video and they put it up in the school and it, and it comes to me and I watch it, analyze it. And I film uh, right here a response, a video exchange. And so, and then they, uh, and I post that. And um, so it's video exchange learning. So it's in a way it's, in my opinion, it's better than one-on-one -on -one live lessons because a student, a player can dive into a particular uh, exercise or, or or song, whatever it is they're working on, and then film it and and then send it to me, and I can analyze it. But in the in that process, you know, there, uh, you know, you the filming is sort of a uh, it, well, it is a kind of a performance, and so you're working hard because you don't want to send a bad video necessarily, and it doesn't matter. I, I want to see what every students send, but you know, and so in that process, you might be working a little extra hard to get that happening and then i have time to to watch it and listen and see see and hear what students are doing right and what they're doing that i could help them improve on and i i, I send that and so uh i've got about uh, a little over 400 students right now and um but not you know doing the ves uh is an option um you know some people just prefer not to do the videos just take the material and, and work on it which is totally cool too um but i've been doing it uh for about eight years now and it's just been you know really fantastic and there's also uh forums and there's a shout box which is kind of like a, a a streaming um you know text thread with everybody in the school so a lot of information is exchanged and it's just a lot of a lot of fun. So that's artistworks artistworks.com. Okay, great. I'll put that in the show notes so everyone can find that as well as the books you mentioned and this book with <laughs> the great Oh yeah. The, the devil's book. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And then until next time we will uh, we will reconvene for another another one of these, and I'll ask you all the other questions, the other difficult questions that I'll save for the next one. There we go. Yes. <laughs> cool. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, Jay.